Further talk on the floor this afternoon was given by Professor Thomas Schick from uh, Göttingen University. Got his PhD from Mainz in 1996 and his habilitation from Münster in 2000. Thomas Schick will talk about the topology of scalar curvature. Positive scalar curvature, indeed. Um, and I think I follow John's lead to just try to speak from here. Uh, yeah, first I thank all the this committees and, and the organizers for organizing this and for giving me the opportunity, the great honor to talk here and thank you for coming and I hope you're not completely bored. I have to admit that I hijacked the topology section, so a lot of what I'm doing is actually not so much about topology but about, um, I don't know, maybe non commutative geometry applied to topology. Let me start with my question I want to study today or discuss. I'm taking a smooth compact manifold M without boundary and I'm asking how does the space of metrics of re positive scalar curvature, Riemann and metrics of positive scalar curvature look like? Uh, this is a topological space, subspace of the space of all these, um, all metrics um, and it has kind of properties like being empty, that's a certain special kind of topological space and that could be one of those. Uh, if it's non-empty it's interesting to know what are the homotopy groups of the components like that. Uh, and here just a reminder, in dimension <coughs> 2, um, these are the three types of scalar curvature, aka curvature you can have. The sphere here is positively curved, this thing is uh, flat, zero curvature, <coughs> and this is a typical negative curvature uh, situation. And um, that this kind of geometry is connected to topology, you've seen already all of those who've attended in um, Miller's talk, uh, that goes back to a very long time. This theorem of gauss bonnet or the gauss bonnet theorem, tells us that the scalar curvature is connected to a topological invariant in case if we look at a two-dimensional uh, manifold. Namely, the integral is the Euler characteristic up to this positive constant, which of course implies that the scalar curvature can only be everywhere positive if the, scalar, uh, if the Euler characteristic is positive, and by the classification of this two-dimensional surfaces, we know <coughs> that can only happen if this is a sphere or the projective um, space, P2, or disjoint unions of such, of course. Uh, yeah, to go back to Gauss, who indeed studied the curvature of surfaces, um, we go into the very first th section uh, or talk by Grötzschel. He was actually interested in this because he was surveying the Earth was making maps like that, I think, not of Westphalia, but of Hanover. Um, and then it's important to understand curvature con situations because that is obviously something difficult to take into account if you, if you measure uh, and make maps of the Earth. Um, I'm not sure whether he came up exactly with this um, formula, so I didn't check his writings. Uh, I want to go to higher dimensions, and higher dimensions, the scalar curvature at a given point is somehow the integral of all the scalar curvatures of the two-dimensional surfaces going through that point. And so that is one possible definition. Another definition is this formula. Um, if you compare the balls of small radius around your given point and the volume of those to the volume of the comparison balls in Euclidean space of the same dimension, well, for small r, there is a Taylor expansion which starts with the constant term, of course, and the next term is a quadratic term, and that is determined by the scalar curvature at that point up to a positive constant depending on dimension. And then there are higher order terms. So you could take this as a definition of scalar curvature. Somehow describes the distortion of volume wise of small balls around your point. Uh, higher dimensional <coughs> geometry, I think, was introduced indeed by Riemann. By the way, Riemann and Gauss were both in Göttingen, where I am now. And <laughs> this is actually. Um, in some sense developed by Riemann's habitation talk, which was assigned to him more or less by Gauss. He gave three themes. One of them was on the um, ideas of geometry, which he thought would never be picked because it was so general, but Gauss knew it's a clever person, so he wanted to know exactly about that. And then Riemann worked like crazy to work out the foundations of geometry. Uh, that's what I read. Uh, why could we be interested in scalar curvature? Well, it features another application in general in, in, in general relativity by Einstein, uh, whose geometric foundations were kind of laid by Minkowski, the theory behind it of um, 
not necessarily Manian geometry, um, another person who was a professor in uh, Göttingen, Minkowski, not Einstein. He gave a talk once. <laughs> um, well, we have to somehow find a replacement for this two-dimensional connection between scalar curvature on one hand and topology on the other hand in higher dimensions. And this formula it generalizes to higher dimensions, but then the scalar curvature is replaced by a much different curvature term, which is not the one we want to study. So we have to resort to something different. And different, um, it turns out, is given by the Dirac operator and its properties. So the Dirac operator was developed by Paul Dirac um, as a square root of the Laplacian using matrix Laplacian, um, essentially in dimension four, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but this was taken up rather early by Erwin Schrödinger, who was thinking about what's happening with this thing on curved space times. And he was making a proposition, a definition of what the Dirac operator was, and it turns out that his definition, which was nat naturally proof that it had to be this in the sense of physicists' proofs, um, turns out not to be the square root of a Laplacian. It is more or less the square root of a Laplacian. This is some kind of a Laplace operator. But there is an error term, and the error term is exactly the scalar curvature again. So this has to be read off. This is a certain operator acting, to that, acting on sections of the spinner bundle, and this scalar curvature is the operator just given by multiplication with this scalar value function. Uh, so what is this global Dirac operator about? We saw um, introduced by Schrödinger in some sense. Uh, on a Riemannian manifold, M, you need a little bit of extra structure. You need a spin structure, which is a strengthened version of an orientation. And once you have that, you can construct, indeed, a certain vector bundle on M, the bundle of spinners, the spinner bundle, sections of it are the spinners. And you can construct this differential operator, order one, acting on it. It's a first order differential operator, which has very nice analytic properties. It is a linear elliptic operator. Um, and well, for what's following, we'll concentrate on the even dimensional case, although everything has uh, generalizations to odd dimensions. And, um, yeah, now I want to explain to you a general framework, which is not essentially, not necessarily the one you, you might have seen, on um, how we can use these <coughs> operators to get information about scalar curvature and, uh, and so on. Uh, so I'm describing now, I'm advertising a general framework, and the general framework is to use um, operator algebras and their cases <coughs> in a kind of consistent and uh, unified way, and I will explain that at, at this basic example we just talked about. So um, for that, we need to know what these C-star algebras are. And that's not very difficult. The C-star algebra is just a sub-algebra of the algebra of all bound operators on Hilbert space, from the infinite dimensional separate Hilbert space. And it should be norm closed, and it should be a star sub-algebra. That's where the star refers to. So we have the adjoint operation, and this should be closed and taking adjoints. That's the C-star algebra. And all our C-star algebras indeed come up in this concrete way as a operators on a Hilbert space. There's also an abstract definition, but for today we don't really need that. Uh, now for such a C-star algebra, well, we need a little condition, otherwise we have to change this definition slightly. We can define two um, groups, K-theory groups, K0 and K1, because I'm talking here about complex C-star algebras, there are only these two. Um, and they're, again, rather easy. One of them is just the group of projections in A, so elements of the form P equals P star equals P squared. And then you need to take homotopy class of those. That gives you K0. And the second group is, well, the group of invertible elements in A, again, up to homotopy. So um, both these are um, easy to define. And uh, we learned now if you want to make elements in K theory, we need to find projectors or we need to find invertibles. And there is a not so easy, but fundamental um, relation here. If you have a C star algebra A and inside it a C star ideal, closed ideal, then these K theory group actually are connected by a six term long exact sequence. Uh, well, there are three easy bits. You can map the K theory of I to the K theory of A to the K theory of A mod I, just taking these projectors and map them forward, the remain projectors. Uh, but then this is exact. And you can connect the K1 and the K0 thing using um, a boundary map, which is not so easy to uh, construct. And you get a long exact sequence. It's a periodic one. So this 
con that connects up there through the sixth term uh, periodic. Um, well, so our Dirac operator is an operator on section of the spinner bundle, so we can form the Hilbert space of L2 section of the spinner bundle, then it's an operator on, on those. Actually, it's an unbounded operator, but um, we can form a bounded one out of it by plugging this operator in functions, in bounded functions. We can use function calculus. It turns out that this is a selfish operator, so we can take functions of the operator, and if you plug in the operator into a bounded function, we get a bounded operator. And that's an element in the C-star algebra of all bounded operators. Here, this um, function chi should be any odd function of which um, goes to 1 as x goes to plus infinity. And you should observe that the choice of these functions is contractible, any two that can be connected. So because k-theory is always about homotopy class of whatever we make, k-theoretically out of such will not depend on the choice because of homotopy variance. Uh, well, as I said, I want to construct on the, concentrate on the even-dimensional case. In the even-dimensional case, the spinner bundle actually splits into two sub-bundles, the bundle of positive spinners, the bundle of negative spinners, and our Dirac operator, or its functions, actually are odd, so they map positive spinners to negative spinners and vice versa, that's why it looks like that. Uh, and if M is compact, come back to that, then it turns out that if ellipticity implies that if you take chi squared of d minus 1, so the function chi we had before, uh, this is a function which goes to plus and minus 1. If you go to infinity, if you square it, it goes to plus 1 at plus infinity and to plus 1 at minus infinity. So if you subtract 1 from it, this whole thing is looking like a function of the Dirac operator where the function goes to 0 as we go to plus and minus infinity. And this implies that it's a very special function. It's close to being 0. And it turns out that this implies that this function of the operator lies in a certain ideal on in the algebra of all bound operators, namely the ideal of compact operators. So that is something where you need to do a little bit of analysis to understand what is happening. This is, in some sense, a form of elliptic regularity, which implies that. Uh, if you look at that, then you can also see that if you take this plus part of our operator, and then you just compose with the unitary, mapping the minus part back to the plus part, so that will be an operator from the plus part from L2 of S plus to itself. Um, and any unitary we do on this set of unitaries is again contractible by Kulker's theorem, they exist. Um, then you get a, an operator from L2 of the plus part to itself. So it's a bound operator on in L, the bound operator on L2 of the plus part. And that guy is going to be invertible modulo the idea of compact operators. So it's invertible inside A mod I. Okay, and the inverse is just um, chi of d minus composed with u star, as you can easily compute from, from this. Okay, so what have you seen here? Um, going back to the definition of what k theory is, each time you have an invertible element in an algebra, you get a k1 class. So you just made an invertible element in a certain algebra, this algebra, so we have a k1 class. That's what happens. K1 class, which I call the fundamental class living in K1 of the algebra A mod I, bounded operators, mod compact operators. <coughs> uh, now, another thing we can learn <coughs> from the general theory, each time we have a K1 class, we can go to, of in a quotient algebra, we can go using this boundary map to K0 of the ideal, and we get a class back there. So let's do that. Um, and let's define the index of the Dirac operator on a compact spin manifold just as applying this boundary map to our fundamental class we just described. Now that's an element in K0 of the idea of compact operators and that's a very special uh, C-star algebra and K-theory is known. It's isomorphic to the complex numbers, canonically equal to the complex numbers, so the index is indeed a complex number, uh, sorry, an integer, not a complex, a very special complex number, an <laughs> integer. <laughs> And, um, well, this integer is actually the index you might have heard of. But I'm presenting it from this abstract point of view because uh, that's what is easy to generalize. Uh, and, well, there has to become something on top. We have defined this index. Uh, it depends on the operator. The operator depends on the metric. But there is a formula for it. The Atiyah-Singer index theorem, this is 
Oxford here and Singer, it lets us compute this index without ever solving some, uh, without ever really going through all this business um, I described. Uh, you just look at the tangent bundle of your manifold, <coughs> and then you, there is a specific formula in terms of the Pontiagin classes of this tangent bundle, can be efficiently computed, and gives you this number as well, for the hat genus of the manifold. So, um, on the one hand, we have the index connecting to the Dirac operator. On the other hand, it's something purely topological, like the um, Gauss-Bonnet theorem, where we have <coughs> something purely topological, Euler characteristic, and something coming from the geometry. Uh, okay, I showed you Schrödinger's calculation that the square of the Dirac operator is this Nabla star Nabla operator plus multiplication with the function scalar curvature of four. This is a positive <coughs> non-negative operator. So if you look at this, you have altogether that the square of the Dirac operator is bounded below by the scalar curvature of a four multiplication operator. Uh, now, if the scalar curvature itself is bounded by some constant which is positive, then you see from that the square is a positive operator bounded by C over four. So the spectrum of the operator cannot contain anything in the interval from minus certain interval around zero, minus square root of zero over two, up to plus square root of zero over two. So that is the connection of scalar curvature and its positivity in particular to the Dirac operator. There's a very special property of the spectrum which follows the positivity of the scalar curvature. Uh, now, we can choose our chi to be any smooth or sufficient so continuous function which goes to plus minus one as we go to plus minus infinity. Uh, so we can certainly, in this situation here, choose chi to be equal to one outside of this interval. <coughs> so on the whole spectrum, it's going to be equal to one or minus one if you're on negative part. That's the odd function. Uh, that means if we square chi, that could be chi squared, sorry, um, we get the function exactly plus one on the spectrum of the Dirac operator. And if we do this functional calculus, <coughs> only the function on the spectrum of the operator counts. So chi squared is that ex identically equal to one already. Before we had seen, I claimed that chi squared is equal to one modulo compact operators, modulo i, now it's honestly one, which implies that our construction which led to the fundamental class, uh, that gives an operator which is invertible already in a. We don't have to mod out i. It's invertible on the nose in a. So what does this mean? It means it gives us an element in K1 of A. Right. The principal invertible elements give classes in K1, applies here, and I call this thing rho of D, G, the structure class. And we could only make it because we had this particular metric G of positive scalar curvature. That's why I'm noting it here. And of course, by functionality, this was exactly the same element we used to define our fundamental class, so this rho class is mapped to the fundamental class if you go from A to A mod I. And I won't talk about this much, but this row class, this structure class, potentially contains information about this specific positive scalar curvature geometry G we used to get it. Okay. Um, by the way, in the case at hand, A is the bounded operators, K1 of A is zero. So we didn't construct a very interesting class, but um, I will get to that a bit later. Um, well, what have we learned? If M has positive scalar curvature, um, claim is, then the index of the Iraq operator has to be zero, which means a hat of m by the Atiyah Singer index theorem has to be zero. So anytime a hat is non-zero and you have a spin manifold, you cannot have positive scalar curvature. That is this line here. An example of that would be the Kummer certain four-dimensional, uh, <coughs> complex two-dimensional, real four-dimensional um, algebraic variety, which um, has non-zero hat genes and is spinning. Non-examples are the tor tori, because they have a hat equal to zero, unfortunately. Uh, still, they don't have positive scalar curvature, but that's not visible with this method. And non-examples are the CP2Ns, because they are not spin manifolds. The a hat is certainly non-zero, but they're not spin manifolds. It's a good thing, because they do have a positive scalar curvature metric. So, otherwise, we would have been in trouble. Why is this holding, this um, vanishing of the index? Well, that's very easy. We had our piece of the long exact sequence we used to define the <coughs> index. Right? We have this fundamental class here mapped to the index. Now we learned positive scalar curvature lets us find this row class one step to the left. So by exactness, if we go two steps, we die. <coughs> so that's a very easy um, 
consequence of, of this setup. Um, well, for the compact up operators, as an idea, the bounded operators, we just have this number, and I wouldn't have had to set up this complicated business. But the, the idea now is um, this is a, a setup which should work in many other situations. It should just look and find more sophisticated C star algebra pairs where this whole um, construction can be applied. Criteria are that we should be able to make the index construction more or less the same way I described it before. So we should get an operator in A from our Dirac operator. It should be in virtual module this ideal I. Um, but we should also have some tools to calculate the KT of these algebras, otherwise they won't be of big use. Right? We knew the KT of the compacts is um, the integers. That was one calculation which was uh, useful. We should also have tools to calculate the index, like the Atiyah-Singer index theorem. That's going to be one of the harder parts um, to connect I mean, the purely topological uh, function analytics set up here to something you can actually compute without doing, having too much to work. Um, and of course, I want that positive scalar coach implies vanishing and gives the structure class in K theory of A. Okay. Uh, so such situations um, <coughs> we should find. And we also mentioned that this is not necessarily restricted to the Dirac operator. If you study homotopy equivalences of orientable manifolds, you could apply that to other operators, signature operator, and you could see what you can get out of that. So there's a lot of potential in this uh, method, and a lot of things have been done with it. Um, and um, I'm going to present um, one particular situation where this works. Um, why is it so important to use C-star algebras here? Uh, C-star algebras are the word which generalize what we know from, from the complexes, that being positive implies that you're invertible. And that's something which you saw in the background. We had um, positivity implies invertibility in our context. So if you think of more general Banach algebras you might want to use, that's not necessarily true. Um, OK, so I'm planning to describe one situation where this general setup um, is sort of implemented and works. And this is um, dealing with non-compact manifold. So I will discuss what we can do if M is not compact. Um, and I should maybe explain why I care about non-compact manifolds in the first place. Um, well, it turns out that this is of relevance even if you study compact manifolds. If you study compact manifolds, um, you can get extra information if you go from your compact manifold to, for instance, its universal covering space. And if you want to get even more information, you should recall the deck transformation action by isometries and asymmetries. Uh, a good example will be the torus, which is covered by Euclidean space, um, of course, with action by Z3M, factor out the torus back. And actually, that is <coughs> one way to see that the tori don't admit positive scalar coverage using this lifting universal covering method. Uh, another the reason why we might care about non-compact manifolds is that if you want to understand manifolds with boundary, maybe compact manifolds with boundary, analysis on compact on manifolds with boundary is notoriously complicated. So one way to deal with this complication is to add a half cylinder to it, boundary times half line. Uh, what you get then is something which doesn't have a boundary anymore. It's somewhere at infinity. Of course, you pay a price. You get something non-compact necessarily. So, um, but this is actually a nice way, if you can deal with non-compact manifolds anyway, to deal with manifolds of boundary. Uh, and let me also mention that there are certainly many important cases when N to start with is non-compact. If you look at general relativity, this is certainly what people are more interested in than the compact. Uh, OK, so what can we do if we have non-compact manifolds? Um, so I have an M, a Riemannian spin manifold, to be complete. And I want to assign to it a more tailor-made uh, C-star algebra, not just all bound operators on the spinner bound. That's going to be, would be too big. I want to be, use something which is more tied up with the geometry and the analysis we can make. And so I define a certain algebra, the coarse algebra, row algebra, C-star of M. And it's defined as an algebra of bound operators on L2 spinners. <coughs> um, but the only special operators I'm allowing. 
I'm allowing operators which have a defined or restricted to have two properties. One is that it has should be an operator which has finite propagation, meaning that if you apply your operator to a compactly supported section, the support of the resulting function or section should only increase by some number RT. Okay. And the second one is some local compactness property. If you think of this operator as given by some kind of a Schwartz kernel, Schwartz integral kernel, this integral kernel has to be supported in a certain neighborhood, R neighborhood of the diagonal, so that's the schematic picture of the Schwartz kernel support. And um, this local compactness means if you take a compact piece out of this Schwartz kernel, and think of this operator given by the compact piece, that has to be a compact operator on L2. So that's certainly a very a much smaller algebra than all bound operators. We want two of those, so that's going to be I, the ideal, and we need a, a bigger algebra in where it's an ideal in. This D star has to satisfy the same um, finite propagation property, but um, the compactness property is weaker, again we have this Schwartz kernel here, we require compactness only of pieces which don't touch the diagonal. So if you touch the diagonal we don't make any condition, only outside we have condition. <coughs> and this turns out to be the situation I, I want, a bigger algebra containing an ideal of small algebra, and also this is factorial for Lipschitz maps. There you have to think about how you define the, the map want to get into the details here. And, well, this is interesting to us because what we did before, namely taking the Dirac operator and plugging it into our chi function, exactly works the right way. We do get um, the chi of d, not just any bound operator, but an operator which indeed lives in this big algebra d star. And moreover, if we look at chi squared minus 1 of d, that lives in the ideal. So it's exactly the same formal properties we had before. Ah. This is assuming that the metric is complete, so what kind Indeed, of that requires that the metric is complete, but, but that's it. Geometry. That's it, you just need completeness of the metric. Yeah. I guess I should have said that before, the four, before I didn't say <laughs> complete. So, ah. And let me show you an idea of why this works. Why is chi of d um, an operator of finite propagation? Well, we can do, whenever you do analysis and you don't know what else to do, you do Fourier inversion. So chi of d can be written as an integral over chi hat of xi times e to the i xi d. Indeed, that really works. I mean, that's not a joke, that really works. Um, and um, the operator e to the i xi d, it's called the wave operator. It's the solution operator to the wave equation. And indeed, it has the properties you expect of a wave propagation operator. It propagates um, only with, well, in our units, unit of uh, wave propagation is one, so if we let the wave run um, for psi, some time psi into r, in, in r, then it propagates by at most an absolute value of psi. So if you have something supported, some wave packet, it propagates at most um, absolute value of r if you let the wave travel until time uh, xi. Well, that works in both directions, positive and negative directions. Um, consequence is, if our chi hat has compact support, let's say in <coughs> minus r until plus r, the only operators which show up here have propagation at most up to value of r, most r, so we all together get an operator of finite propagation. Um, now, our chi function ha maybe not necessarily has this property, but it's close to one of this kind. I mean, the chi of d, if you work it out, you can choose indeed uh, a model for chi of d where the uh, propagation is finite. Or if you don't, it's a limit of such. And that's good enough because we took sister algebras which are close, so we take limits anyway. Uh, well, that is a basic fundamental property of the Dirac operator. It has a unit wave, uh, unit <coughs> speed of, of the wave operator property, and that gives us a fine propagation for our chi of d. Uh, and elliptic regularity, local elliptic regularity implies that chi of d has its compactness property we needed to get an element in d star. And why don't we get an element in c star right away? Which, which is, this is because the 
for a transform of chi of a function which goes to plus minus one at infinity actually is nicely smooth except for the origin metric where it has a singularity. And that singularity avoids um, us to let us make the, the analysis at the diagonal. So uh, just to give an idea for that. Whereas chi squared minus one is a nice smooth function or its fun Fourier transform is everywhere smooth, so there we have no problem, we get really an element C star. <coughs> Ah, now the business works exactly it did before. We get a fundamental class, we have an invertible mod in D star mod C star, we get applying the boundary map in the K theory exact sequence and coarse index in the K theory C star, and uh, the same property about the choice of chi also applies that if the scalar curvature is positive, is bounded below by some constant C bigger than zero, <coughs> then we can lift our um, fundamental class to a structure class living in the K theory of D star, that should be K theory of, and the index <coughs> then vanishes in K theory of C star. Okay, so one situation where the program can be implemented <coughs> without any problem. Um, and I talked about computability, I required there should be computability, and indeed, for these algebras, computability, computation tools have been worked out. There is a my Vitor sequence, which allows us to compute this by cutting the space M up into simplest pieces, and we have vanishing results for certain court spaces, particular M is of the form something else times a half line. All of these groups always vanish. Um, and if you put, and there are other tools I don't describe, if you put these two together and you think about it, you can um, decompose R into two half lines and the second thing at a point. So. Um, Using my torus and this vanishing result, we can see that the calculation of the k theory of C star and E star of Euclidean spaces can just be inductively pushed to doing the same for a point, which is not so hard, and gives us this result in particular. Uh, one application of this, so so far I just set up the whole uh, situation. Um, Assume we want to understand the torus, describing now how to prove that there's no positive scalar curvature metric on the torus, or more generally, on um, a manifold M, which is the total space of a fiber bundle, which fibers over the torus, and the base, uh, the, sorry, the fiber <coughs> itself is some compact spin manifold whose a hat genus is non zero. P could be the point that is a manifold with a hat equal to one. So um, the torus is covered, but this is a slightly bit more general. Um, then, okay, I told you before, we should use the covering idea to bring the non-compactness into picture, into play. We can pass to the covering according to the projection onto the Z to the N coming from this torus. And we get the covering of M by M tilde, which is fibering over R to the N with the same fiber P. Okay. And well, this maps to R to the N, so we can use the functionality of our C star and K theory to map our course index to the K theory of the C star of Rn, which we just computed before. Well, then I have to make sure that I'm right as, as dimensions, and I get the integers as in answer. So again, we have assigned to our um, manifold M here an integer um, which can tell us something about scalar curvature because it's made out of the index of the drag operator. Okay. Positive scalar curvature would mean this is zero, so the image would also be zero, and so we have here a number we can produce in this non-compact, in this new setting, um, which can decide whether we have positive scalar curvature or not. We need still to compute this thing here, and there is a partition manifold index theorem, and, but it can be applied to tell us that this number we get here is exactly the a hat genus of the fiber. Okay. So, okay, you have to work to prove this theorem, I won't tell you how. Um, but now we can apply it if, because we assumed a hat is non-zero, we cannot have positive scalar curvature because that would contradict the vanishing of this force index. So the torus is covered by that example. Um, let me give you a second application of this business, um, which goes back to Romer and Lawson, and is refined by Bernd Hanke and myself a little bit. Um, here I'm taking, again, a compact spin manifold, 
And now I want to measure the, an obstruction, the positive scalar curvature, using a sub manifold of co dimension 2. It should have a, a tubular neighborhood inside M, which is just looking like the sub manifold times D2, so a trivial tubular neighborhood. Um, I will not make two topological <coughs> assumptions on top of that. One of them is that the second homotopy group of M should be trivial, I'm assuming it's connected. And the other one should be that on pi 1 level, the map from N to M is also injected. So on a sub-manifold, it's pi 1 injected. Uh, then we can conclude that the big manifold does not have a positive scalar curvature metric if a certain index invariant for the sub-manifold is non-zero. And now this is a refinement, another direction of refinement. Uh, this is an index taking values <coughs> in the K-theory, yet another C-star algebra, shows up, which is assigned to the fundamental group of N. Um, and an example, which was already covered by Gromov and Lawson, um, but this is kind of, I mean, for the example, it works the same way, but this is more general Gromov and Lawson did. If you take a three manifold with trivial pi two and with infinite pi one, okay, this is in some sense the most interesting case, a prime um, three manifold with infinite pi one, so we are away from homotopy spheres, um, then the, it's very easy to find an appropriate sub-manifold. Just take a circle representing a non-zero homotopy um, element in pi one. It's automatically of infinite index, uh, of infinite order. Uh, so this also by the dimension conditions, I'm assuming this is oriented, if not I'm passing to the orientation cover. So the normal bundle here will also be oriented. So we have a trivial normal bundle situation. You see this circle satisfies all the conditions. And it turns out that this circle satisfies also this condition. It's a little bit like the S1 case of the torus discussed in general. Uh, so no, <coughs> essentially no three manifold, no interesting three manifold admits a metric of positive scalar curvature. And if we put the solution of the Proctor conjecture together, we can make a complete list of all manifolds which do admit in dimension three, which do admit metrics of positive scalar curvature. The only exceptions are, of course, the three sphere, S2 times S1, quotient of the three sphere, and then you can do connected sums of such. Okay, let me explain you how we can prove this and how it relates to, um, to this coarse geometry situation, uh, ideas. We take our M, we pass to a suitable covering, which is infinite, corresponding to the fundamental group of N in M. Uh, out of this covering, we take out the norm bundle of our sub-manifold, and then we double along the boundary, which is the normal bundle times S1. So we get a situation like that. Okay, This is a very non-compact manifold and has this compact core inside it. Um, that's a little bit like the situation we had before, where you said we pass to the covering, that's a very non-compact manifold and has this compact core, one fiber in it. And <coughs> you said in such situations we have such index theorems, they can be applied here as well. Um, and we need some vanishing theorems for the index because of positive scalar curvature. We have to work a bit harder here because when you do this gluing, you will have to destroy, change the metric in the gluing region. You have to make sure that you glue smoothly so your positive scalar curvature is only given outside a neighborhood of this compact region here. That's why we need some improved vanishing results. So things one has to prove to establish this. Um, well, I guess I want to explain a bit more what is the business about this sister algebra here and this index. And that's another idea from non-comp geometry. Um, before we used the complex numbers as our um, base field, all Hilbert spaces were Hilbert spaces were complex numbers and the operators were linear operators. <coughs> um, but think of the complex numbers just as a certain special sister algebra, a small one. And the idea is these scalars, the complex numbers, should be replaceable and replaced by any other C star algebra, A. Well, and indeed, this can be done. We can work instead of with Hilbert spaces, with Hilbert modules, where the scalar product is taking values in that. And if you bundles of vector spaces before, we now work with bundles of these Hilbert modules. There's a well developed theory 
for, initiated by Mishenko and Fomenko for this, and Higgs and Pierre and Rohr have done that, and we can, in some sense, really everywhere replace the scalars, complex numbers, by more general scalars. And everything goes through the same way. The analysis becomes harder, and more, more delicate, but you can really do it. And one particular C-star algebra which is prominently used instead of the complex numbers <coughs> are C-star algebras associated to the fundamental groups of the spaces and questions, which are just certain C-star algebra closures of the complex group ring. That's a purely algebraic gadget, um, but you can find suitable C-star algebra closures of that, and then you convert with those. Uh, and the whole story then relates also to the baum kohn conjecture, which tells you something about the k theorem of exactly this C-star algebra, which I don't want to get into too much. Um, and I told about that. And indeed, we can, on a compact manifold, make this, what some people call Rosenberg index, the index of the Dirac operator, that's the thing we just saw before, which lives in the case here of the C-star algebra of the fundamental group, and refining the index, which takes value to the complex number to start with. So you should think of this as just another setting, which I go into details, of this A mod I idea we had before. Um, and indeed, there was the Gromov Loss and Rosenberg conjecture saying that this index of the Iraq operator living in the K theory of the C star algebra of the fundamental group, but well, we have to be a slightly bit more precise here, uh, it's vanishing. That's implied by having positive scalar curvature. It should be an if and only if condition, if the dimension of the manifold is at least five. Uh, that's not quite true. There is a counterexample. Uh, there is still the stable version of that, which is. Um, open and interesting and in many cases proved. And really the question is, how much exactly does this index invariant see about positive scalar curvature? Um, now, I don't want to talk about this improved vanishing. And um, I want to talk about one thing, which again explains why working with <coughs> non-compact manifolds is interesting. Assume you want to compare two metrics of positive scalar curvature on a given manifold. And I think of one sitting on the left of this picture, another one on the right of this picture. Uh, we can always connect those two metrics through the space of all metrics, because the space of all metrics is connected. Uh, this is this middle picture here. So you should think of this as R times some manifold with a given metric constantly on the left, a given metric constantly on the right. In the middle, there are some interpolations going on. Okay. Uh, in the middle, we don't have positive scalar curvature necessarily, but left and right we have. And then the setup we use gives us um, an index for this situation, which depends on the positive scalar curvature metric on the left and on the right, living in another K theory group of another C star algebra, which is assigned to this situation, which you can compute. And it's just giving you the old K theory of C star pi 1 of n back to twice. Um, and with these methods, one can now somehow distinguish metrics of positive scalar curvature. Right? So before we talked about vanish existence or not, now we're trying to distinguish. And here I'm giving you uh, my last slide, I guess. Um, these methods um, give you indeed ways to make metrics of positive scalar curvature, which are really different from each other. The statement is the following. If you take um, any manifold which has a metric of positive scalar curvature, so the space of all metrics of positive scalar curvature is empty, then we can make whole big families characterized by spheres representing elements in pi k of this space, families of metrics of positive scalar curvature, um, which are elements of infinite order in pi k. Well, there is a condition on the dimension of m being big enough and a parity condition on uh, the dimension and this degree here. Um, and if M is a sphere, these classes remain infinite even if you mod out of the space of all metrics of positive scalar curvature the action by the diffeomorphism group. Because somehow if you can make many metrics you think are different, but they're just isometric to each other, which is maybe not so interesting. But these are even interesting metrics in the modular space. Um, and but we have to construct those, and we have to show they are really different. The construction on this uh, is based on making an interesting bundle of manifolds over SK, 
um, which we get, now topology really comes into play using searching theory and smoothing theory. And um, let me finish now. Um, nothing of what I told you can be done for manifold without spin structure, except for the gauss monet theorem. But two dimensional manifolds have spin structure anyway. Uh, so the big question, which is really open, is in high dimensions, what can we say about positive scalar curvature on manifolds without a spin structure? <coughs> which in nothing is known. But embarrassingly, nothing is known. The second question, I come back to that, is how much does this Rosenberg index really tell us? Um, and things where we could try to use this, but we still don't know. If you take the torus and you modify it to make the fundamental group from Z mod Z to the N, Z mod 3 Z to the N, but just doing surgeries, which kills the third powers of all the generators of the fundamental group, Nobody knows whether this manifold does admit a metric of positive scalar curvature or not, even if you can do this with having a spin structure. And what we really don't understand, what we should be able to do is eventually try to understand the homotopy type of the space of metrics fully. For S2, we know what it is. For S3, we know something. We know sometimes <laughs> it's empty, but that's all. So with this, I want to stop. different approach, and certainly worth studying, in particular if you're interested in non-spin manifolds, but one has to come up with the right idea that um, I can't unfortunately offer. Okay, let's uh, thank Thomas again.